Hey everyone, we are live again today here at New South Neurospine. My name is Lanier Clark and I do the marketing here. Today we are in our physical medicine and rehabilitation division and I've got Dr. Michael Winkleman with us today and he's going to start off with talking about Botox and migraines. Um, so please, if you get a chance, leave a comment and ask a question. We've got some Visa gift cards that we're going to be giving away today and um, I will be happy to put these in the mail to you and um, make sure you leave a comment for us. Okay, you ready? Here is uh, Dr. Michael Winkleman. He's going to tell him a little bit about himself first. Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Winkleman and I'm a physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation here at New South Neurospine. And uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, treatment of Botox uh, um, for migraine headaches. And uh, with uh, uh, the Botox treatments, uh, they actually started um, using Botox um, in 1979. And there it was used mostly for dystonia and for spasticity. And uh, since I'm an old guy, uh, I learned how to use it uh, way back when in 1990 when uh, it was used for spasticity. And uh, in spasticity, we have uh, mostly patients with uh, spinal cord injury, head injury that had uh, spasms in their limbs and they had to be relaxed. So Botox was used for that in order to uh, accommodate that uh, problem and to uh, help them with it. Now, um, during um, the time that we've used it, we've actually seen that Botox helped other problems. And so therefore it was utilized uh, in treatment of blepharospasm, which are spasms around the eyes, um, it was used then also for spastic dysphonia when patients have a shaky voice. Um, and it was also used in patients that had had uh, various uh, issues with migraine. And uh, uh, the approval for migraine use was in 19, actually in 2010. But uh, um, we've actually noticed that patients that were treated for blepharospasms and also for cosmetic use actually had significant improvement in their uh, migraine headaches. And during that period of time, actually I've already used it off-label uh, prior to its approval uh, for, the, for the migraine. Now, um, in the use of migraine, uh, uh, patients uh, can be injected uh, with uh, Botox and it is uh, a protocol that uh, has been developed. Now the protocol was um, uh, developed by uh, um, migraine specialists and they would inject 32 um, spots on the face. Here particularly at the base of the skull, uh, in the forehead, as well as uh, in uh, the temple. Um, the injections would be 155 units uh, of the botulinum toxin and then uh, it would be used uh, um, mostly every three months or 12 weeks. Um, medication was not all that effective uh, uh, beyond that point and uh, um, we have pretty much seen that that holds true about 12 weeks. Um, the Botox can, however, be uh, also detrimental, and so we have to make sure that we do not use an excessive amount of the toxin, as it can cause uh, some weakness in the muscles around the eyes, and then uh, you'd have a little bit of a droopy eye. But that has actually been very well controlled and with the uh, use of the medication uh, uh, appropriately. Um, that has not been a problem that uh, we've seen uh, very often. Um, the uh, general uh, um, consensus is that uh, I, I've used Botox uh, more so uh, for, for the migraines uh, um, using a different protocol. And uh, I use about six injections instead of the 
the 30 injections that uh, have been uh, in the protocol and actually had the same level of um, uh, response. With that, uh, only uh, the spaces right here in the forehead, at the temples and at the base of the skull have to be injected. And uh, that uh, particular uh, intervention is being done um, every 12 weeks. Now, the intervals are not because of the medication and the, the effectiveness of the medication, but it's actually because the um, receptors regenerate. So if you're a young person, your receptors may generate a little quicker. If you're an older person, they may not quite re regenerate at the same uh, speed. Um, Botox can be used for many other indications, as I mentioned earlier, the spasticity, blepharospasm, but even uh, patients with uh, um, uh, hyperhidrosis, sweating in the armpits, uh, can also be treated with Botox and quite effectively so. Um, those don't need to be retreated but every six months to a year, whereas unfortunately the, the migraines have to be uh, done more frequently. So you said Botox can be used to treat for sweating? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. it's, and it's quite effective for that. In fact, uh, I have a number of patients that uh, uh, come every, every six months or a year in order to have that, have that done. So you didn't really talk about where you're from and oh. your training and your background. Tell them a little bit about yourself, Dr. Lefkowitz. Um, I was uh, born in Germany and uh, raised in Germany and Austria. Uh, went to medical school at the University of Vienna in Austria and uh, then came to the United States. Did my residency at first in internal medicine at the University of Vienna, uh, at the University of uh, um, here in Jackson, Mississippi, UMC, and did my, my second residency uh, here um, uh, in uh, uh, Baylor in Houston. And this, that is uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I've been board certified in, in PMNR ever since 1993. Well, when I first started working here at New South Neurospine, I had no idea what a physiatrist was. Tell everybody and tell our viewers what a physiatrist is. Physical medicine and rehabilitation is a specialty that, that deals with function mostly. Trying to get patients that have had either an injury or um, have had an illness that left them with impaired function or pain and uh, uh, to try and optimize their ability to uh, uh, perform their job and, and get uh, full enjoyment of their life. What made you want to go into physiatry? Uh, physical medicine is uh, a specialty that is uh, um, a, um, it, it, it enters many different specialties. Um, uh, obviously, I've been trained in internal medicine, but uh, it actually has uh, um, lots of connections to neurology, to orthopedics, uh, neurosurgery and uh, uh, multiple other uh, uh, specialties like rheumatology and, and internal medicine. And it's just uh, easier for me, um, I'm, I'm ADD, so I, I don't like to do just one thing. And uh, so uh, it, it, uh, it interests me much more uh, to be able to do multiple things. How do you make it to Jackson, Dr. Lickleman? Um, because I did my initial residency here at uh, University Medical Center, I had lots of contacts. And uh, when I did my second uh, residency in physical medicine in Houston, uh, I, uh, um, after that I came back to Jackson as actually uh, more so an interview that, that opened up and uh, um, uh, it was just a, a good fit and a good match and it was just a, um, it felt like coming home and uh, that's why we came back to Jackson. Sarah Stoner says she misses you and hello. Missing her too, missing her too. I believe she has a baby by now. I think she does. Yeah.
Yeah. What are some of the side effects of Botox injections? Mostly the effect uh, of the toxin itself. Um, when you um, use Botox, it is a paralytic agent. It actually will bind irreversibly to the acetylcholine receptor. And as such, it blocks the transmission of a neural response from the nerve to the muscle. And uh, so when you use the Botox, you paralyze the muscle. Now, again, it is, it is of utmost importance that you localize your injections properly because otherwise you will have some weakness in the area. Also using too much toxin can then get into the system and therefore also cause you some side effects. We have a, a long time patient on here, Catherine Mitchell. She says hello, but she also wants to know, um, well, she wants you to talk about rooster cone injections and how they work for pain. Sure. Um, we've been using Hyalgin as Cinebisc injections for joint pain and uh, have been doing that for many years. Um, the um, rooster comb actually, um, it's just it's just one one area where where it where it uh, was harvested initially, and uh, it is a lubricant. It's uh, uh, and it it helps um, lubricate the joints uh, um, and reduce the friction. Um, it is a very large molecule and therefore uh, does not get absorbed uh, by the uh, mucous membranes around the knee itself or you know in in other joints. The knee is actually the only one that has been FDA approved. There's some approval of uh, the shoulders uh, for high organ injections, but it's really not being done very often. And uh, I have used it off label for hip injections before, um, and uh, it works fairly well there too. Um, mostly the pain reduction is by not having quite as much friction at the joint area when you have some joint incongruity. What, most people, when they get those type of injections, do you then refer them down to physical medicine now that they're able to move and like strengthen that area more? Um, uh, when you have somebody that has had osteoarthritis in a joint, um, they usually have um, some associated pain, but with that comes also some atrophy. Um, so you're not quite as strong as you used to be and uh, um, optimizing the strength and then using the regained range of motion helps uh, actually um, become more functional and again that function uh, and functional improvement is what we're aiming for. Kelly wants to know um, how often do you need the injections for Botox? Botox injections in general um, have the limitation of uh, um, about 12 weeks. They're effective for that period of time because the receptors regenerate. When the receptors regenerate, um, you start having a recurrence of the migraine headaches. And uh, the, um, this period of time was kind of uh, more so established by the company at first, and uh, then it was whittled down a little bit by the insurance companies because they don't necessarily want to pay for it too often. What I've seen in my practice here is that it's effective for about 10 weeks. The uh, next two weeks, it starts w declining in effectiveness and patients start having an increase in their migraine. How long after you get the, the injections? Misty wants to know um, how long does it take for them to go into effect? Um, generally speaking, it, it, uh, it's a little bit of a, um, it's a, it's a variation. Some patients have almost immediate onset and uh, they start having um, relief of the migraines from day one. Uh, for spasticity in general, I tell patients to expect a 10 day period before they see any significant relief. Okay. Also, what are some of the medications that people have to take in order to qualify for insurance to cover the cost of the Botox injections and what could be some of their side effects? Um, 
Unfortunately, um, Botox is not easily uh, uh, approved and a lot of insurance companies are quite uh, hesitant to allow us to use the Botox. And that's mostly because of the cost of the intervention. Um, uh, it actually is, is still a bargain considering the price of some of the other medications that are being used, like the CGRPs. Uh, that are equally as expensive and have to be given with an injection once a month. But uh, generally speaking, uh, the uh, um, uh, medications that have to be used for uh, the approval are either a um, antidepressant medication, um, then you have to fail that, um, use um, a seizure medication or an anticonvulsant Again, have to fail that and the, the period of time that you have to use it is at least two or three months. Um, in addition to that um, we have can calcium channel blockers or beta blockers which are blood pressure medications that have to be used for that period of time. Uh, when you fail at least three of these medication groups then you're a candidate for Botox if you have a number of Botox, uh, a number of uh, migraines, uh, more than 15 a month. And it doesn't necessarily have to be migraines, but it has to be headache days. How long so, do the headaches have to last? Um, at least two hours uh, or so. Uh, they, they don't have to be just a twinge of headache, but they have to be actually a, a significant headache. What about a headache when you see little dots? The, um, or... the scintillating scotoma, uh, are some prodromal migraines and uh, we see those often or patients often have prodromals before they have a migraine and they can vary. It can either be something in your visual field, they sometimes can be um, buzzing in your ears or it can be associated with uh, um, yawning. Uh, I've had uh, a patient that started in uncontrollable yawning short before he would get a migraine. So it can be different. So after um, you get the injection and it starts working, you have to wait wait 12 weeks. Is there, have you ever had a patient where it wears off and the Botox doesn't work anymore? Or does, is it pretty effective each time you get an injection? There are always variations. Um, migraine is so susceptible to stress and a lot of patients have more migraines when they're stressed out and so uh, if at work they have a lot of uh, a lot on their shoulders they may have an increase in their migraine uh, and that is not necessarily affected by the by the uh, 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 botox um, Generally speaking though, the severity and the intensity of those migraine attacks is going to be substantially uh, decreased. Majority of your patients that get Botox for migraines, do they experience good outcomes most of the time? Um, absolutely. The majority of the patients actually have uh, um, a more profound relief of their migraine and a longer lasting relief. Quite a number of patients will not have any uh, migraine or headaches during the period of time that they're treated. Um, except again for that last two weeks when they start having an increase in the frequency. Misty wants to know, can you take other medications while taking the Botox, while getting the Botox injections? Absolutely. Um, the, the newer ones are the CGRPs uh, that are, uh, have been used recently and have been FDA approved also for the breakthrough. Um, so they can be used uh, orally and then um, in addition to that uh, there are certainly all the triptans like Maxot, Imitrex, uh, medications like that that are immediately used for the rescue when you have a migraine. Renee wants to know the difference between therapeutic Botox versus cosmetic Botox. Uh, cosmetic Botox is mostly used in order to reduce some of the little folds around your, your eyes and uh, forehead and uh, they're quite effective by uh, reducing uh, the, the muscle activity there. 
Um, we all are prone to develop uh, habitually lines around our eyes, and I have lots of them. <laughs> I should be using it myself. Uh, but uh, um, the, um, these actually uh, diminish significantly with the use of the Botox. And if done properly, you do not have a significant uh, uh, reduction in your, in your facial uh, expressions. Dana Barnes wants to know, is Botox covered in the fee schedule in regarding workers' compensation? Um, yes, we, we do see a number of patients who actually uh, are workman's comp and are receiving Botox injections and it is being covered. But like with every other insurance, we have to justify the use of the Botox and it has to be specifically for that case then. What per, what, when do you do the Botox injections here at New South Marysville? Is there a certain day that you schedule I, those patients? I usually do it uh, on, on a Friday. And the reason why I do it just on one day is that uh, uh, it gives me a little bit more time with each patient. Uh, I have uh, um, time set aside uh, to, to do procedures and don't have to rush from one patient to the next. And I can, can give the patient my full attention. What other type of injections do you do to help people with their pain? Um, I do a lot of joint injections, um, uh, shoulder, um, knee, hip injections are all something that we do on a daily basis and we usually use ultrasound guidance in order to accomplish that to make sure that we absolutely hit the right spot. Um, this gives us uh, um, more of a, of a safety than anything else um, because anatomically you can inject a joint but then you have confirmation that you're just exactly where you need it to be. What type of patient would be um, ideal for a hip injection? What would be going on with them to for them to come and see you for it to be effective? Hip injections are just generally being done uh, for me as a diagnostic in, uh, tool and very often I have patients come to me or sent to me for uh, back pain that is radiating down into the hip. Mm -hmm. um, but very often we find out that it is not back pain radiating into the hip, but it's hip pain that is also involving the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that reason, it is helpful for me to be able to inject the hip and then see whether or not there is some improvement there. What do you inject it? What's in the injection? Um, when I do an injection of the hip, I usually use uh, a local anesthetic mm -hmm. like Marcaine and uh, um, usually use also a little steroid in order to have then some therapeutic effect. And uh, the Marcaine in essence numbs up the joint. So when the patient gets off the table and uh, I do the procedure usually mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the hip injections uh, under a C-arm and when the patient gets off the table they, they will immediately know whether or not there was some benefit from that and uh, um, because the pain is already um, no. reduced mm -hmm. and it's numbed and you don't really feel anything. Um, if the hip is the problem, you will know because you don't have any pain. If the hip is not the problem, you will still have your pain. And how long do those injections last or um, how long are they effective? That varies upon the, se the severity. If you have a joint that is really, really a ready joint that is, that is uh, um, end stage, it's not going to last very long, maybe a week. If, however, you have a joint that has minimal arthritic changes in it, but is nonetheless painful, it can last for a year. Mm. And so you can get very good relief from that because the inflammation is substantially reduced. Are there, is there a certain amount that you can get of those a year or? In general, I don't like giving steroid injections more than three or four times a year. And the reason for that is that uh, steroids have a side effect. And uh, um, here particularly, what I'm worried about is developing a vascular necrosis, which What's would that? be actually a, um, well, it, it's the destruction of the joint. It's usually the head of the femur that is involved or, you know, uh, shoulder as well as the knee can be involved with that. And if you give too much steroid, it can lead to the joint destruction and then you really have a reason for a joint replacement, which is not what we wanted in the first place. Mm -hmm. Could you educate our viewers just for a minute on trigger point injections? Yeah. Uh, trigger point injections are, are 
being done mostly for muscular pain. And uh, muscular pain can be a primary or it can be a secondary myofascial pain. And myofascial pain is actually, again, just descriptive for muscle-related pain. Um, the um, biggest work or the uh, work that was done was by Janet Travell, and she started out uh, developing the trigger point injections. Before that, actually, the Chinese have been doing locus dolendi acupuncture. Um, and locus dolendi means the painful point. And they would stick a needle into that area, and it gave relief. So it's been given for a long time. Uh, trigger point injections, I usually uh, focus on the paraspinal muscles and the upper trapezii, which are on the top of the shoulder or around the neck area or in the lower back. Those are the main areas where I see trigger points. What other type, you talked about spasticity, talk about that and um, what that is and injections to help with that. Sure. Um, spasticity is actually a term that is for uh, in an increased tone in the muscles. And that increased tone is uh, often uh, because of spinal cord or brain injury or stroke. Um, if you have a condition that is uh, of an upper motor neuron etiology, in other words, it comes from either the spinal cord or the brain, it can be associated with spasticity. And spasticity um, can be treated with various medications. We can actually use baclofen and Xanaflex for the treatment uh, of the spasticity. We can uh, use Those injections. Those oral medications? Those are oral medications. We can use injections, and here particularly Botox injections are being used. In the past, we used phenol injections and alcohol injections in order to um, actually treat spasticity, here particularly in the calf, when patients had clonus uh, after, after a stroke or after a spinal cord injury. Is that just not being and able to move your, your that's foot right. up yeah. and down? And it would just block that completely. Uh, but that is, the alcohol injections are irreversible, whereas the, um, the phenol injections wear off after about six months. Do the alcohol injections hurt? Yes. <laughs> Someone had a question earlier about the Botox injections. Are they painful? Um, Botox injections are usually done with a very, very small gauge needle. Um, uh, un, you know, it's about the size of a tuberculin needle, which is about a 27 to a 32 gauge needle. And as we're, I'm going up with the numbers, the size goes down. Um, and uh, so it is a prick uh, and it does hurt, but it is not horribly painful. Otherwise I would not have any repeat customers. Mm -hmm. Talk about what what do you see majority of the time? What is in your patients that you see, what do you see the most of? What would you say? Um, here at uh, NS2, we, we have a lot of spine related patients. And uh, we're in, in practice with uh, uh, neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery who are quite focused on the treatment of spine related ailments here particularly cervical and lumbar spine so the rehabilitation of patients with cervical or lumbar spine uh, related injuries uh, are what we do um, we do the um, treatment of non-surgical cases uh, who don't require surgery or treat them after they've had surgery in order to get them back to function mm -hmm. um, What's most beneficial if you've had, um, say, a ACDF and you still have a little bit of weakness, what do you recommend for that type of person? Usually uh, patients will already have had some exposure to physical therapy and we have a physical therapy department that is excellent, that is particularly well versed in treating patients with spinal conditions strengthening the muscles around the neck, strengthening the muscles uh, that actually give you posture, uh, core muscles, and th th those are the things that we particularly focus on in order to uh, regain better function and mobility. One of the ways that New South has had to innovate during COVID-19 is telemedicine. What's been your experience with talking to your patients through uh, a video screen like the one we're on right now? 
Well, uh, I think that it, it has uh, uh, been actually quite uh, educational to us because uh, uh, we feel in general that um, using a, a, a phone or a computer to actually treat and talk to a patient is, is foreign to us because we have not been able to do that. It's actually not been legal in the state of Mississippi to do it for um, the whole time that I've practiced until now. And uh, um, for patients whom I've already known and have already treated, that's a very nice avenue for me to continue to interact, check on them and appropriately refill their medications or direct them to further care. Uh, on the other hand, patients that have uh, not been seen before, uh, it's a little bit more difficult for me to uh, get a good picture as to uh, what the problem is just over the phone. And I know that some of our physicians do that to more so assess whether or not they need further care and to see whether or not uh, somebody needs to come in and actually be seen in person. So. Well, I think that's about all the time we have today. I'm gonna announce some gift card winners. I'll let you have that then. <laughs> so we have two gift card winners and I'll be happy to stick this in the mail to you. We're gonna have Catherine Chisholm and Dana Barnes. We um, hope to see you soon, Dana. And thank you all for tuning in today and we appreciate y'all leaving comments and we will see y'all next time. Next week, we're gonna be talking to Dr. Lynn Stringer. So be on the lookout for updates about that. Thanks you guys.